and you do it for a week straight, I am just like, if I fall asleep during the second hour, during my own message, that's why. If you see me nodding, it's been like 12, 13 hour days of hard physical labor that I'm not used to. I, I'm going to do something a little different here. This is for Anna, current events here. I, I found three, <laughs> and I haven't done a single one of these, but I just, just in your honor here. Um, I, th I thought these were interesting articles. The first one is, Atheist Richard Dawkins now labels himself a cultural Christian. Here's why. Has anybody heard of um, Richard Dawkins? He's one of the most, uh, I'd probably say, outspoken atheist, evolutionist. He's written some books. I think one of them is The God Delusion. And uh, Tom, could you uh, shut that door? <laughs> Don't know what they're doing in the other classes, but there's a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth there. <laughs> Usually it's yelling and uh, singing, but this is, something's going on there. So, uh, famous atheist Richard Dawkins has spent years criticizing religion. I, I, I think it is God delusion that he says, um, religion is the cause of all wars. Who's ever heard that, that statement? Uh, anybody know what the actual statistics are? It's, uh, I actually looked it up. What? Much less. It's 8 to 10 percent wars are fought due to religion. So that's a, a blatant lie. But think about it. Um, but this is something they keep peddling. You can look it up. The first site that comes up will tell you 8 to 10. Think of all the past wars in the last 100 years. World War I, World War II, Vietnam. You know, none of those had anything to Korean War. None of them had anything to do with religion. Think of how many... Um, communist, atheist dictatorships have killed in the past century. Million, hundred, 60 million, maybe more. It's, it's incredible. But um, so he's just been anti-God, anti-religion. Dawkins told Rachel Johnson of LBC, I count myself a cultural Christian. I love hymns and Christmas carols, and I sort of feel at home in the Christian ethos. If I had to choose between Christianity and Islam, i choose Christianity every single time, Dawkins continued. He explained his reason being that Christianity is a fundamentally decent religion, while Islam is not. When questioned on this belief, he responded that the Quran is fundamentally hostile to women and gays, and he likes to live in a culturally Christian country, although he doesn't believe a single word of the Christian faith. <laughs> um, Peck Ray is shocked. This seems like a shift in his ethos, if you will, he says. I will say cultural Christianity from Richard Dawkins is pretty interesting. Uh, you know why? Because he's seen the decay of society and civilization. That's why. He sees a very civilization crumbling around us and what keeps it together, Gray adds. We've kind of taken for granted in America the foundation of our laws and Christianity and, and uh, is the foundation of you know, our society, and then we just all thought it, we just had a common, just, they thought that was normal, and then when we take that uh, foundation out, everything starts to crumble, and everybody's looking around thinking, well, maybe we needed that, maybe we needed morality, maybe we needed uh, right and wrong, maybe we needed the Bible, and everybody's kind of realizing the effects, and things go crazy. Everybody likes to take it out, why? Because they want to do what they want to do. If I get rid of God, I can do what I want to do. But man, it's wicked, and we're seeing just it getting worse and worse, and you can't tell anybody they're wrong because there's no right and wrong. It's whatever I want to do. And so uh, one of the most outspoken atheists is saying, oh, yeah, maybe we need a little Christianity back in here. Uh, America was founded on Christian values, and Dawkins is recognizing what happens when the masses reject those uh, values. So that, that's number one um, interesting article. Here's another one. Scientists still baffled from giant... Human skeletons up to 10 feet tall decades after initial discovery. And these were actually a series of mysterious giant skeletons up to 10 feet tall reportedly discovered in and around Nevada caves last century, dubbed the Giants of Lovelock, are still baffling scientists decades later. The claims about supersized humans who roamed the area around Lovelock, a remote town 90 miles northwest of Reno thousands of years ago, are rooted in Native American lore which tells of fierce, red-headed, pale-skinned giants who arrived from Central America by boat and attacked local tribes. After years of war, the foreign invaders were chased into a cave and slaughtered en masse, according to story passed down by the indigenous Paiute people. 
Experts believe the tale of the giant warrior's violent extermination is likely a legend, but reports of discoveries made in the area of Lovelock decades ago have continued to raise many unanswered questions. And there's more, you know, it talks about the history, how they've discovered them, it includes seven, eight feet tall, and then um, ten feet tall. So I just thought that was interesting. You know, the Bible talks about the uh, giants of a neck. And last one here. Just give a second. My phone is pulling it up here. I thought this was interesting. Uh, every blue-eyed person is a descendant of one single human. It's shocking to most of us, right? This is pretty interesting. Researchers study people with blue eyes from a range of countries to reach this conclusion. That's because every uh, single one of the 7.8 billion people on the planet who has blue eyes is a descendant of the same person. It's an icky thought if you're in the person, you're in a relationship, both happen to have blue eyes. I'm afraid it's just something you'll have to accept. Um, the common ancestors. Anybody want to take a guess when this common ancestor lived? Wild guess. Wild guess. Based on your biblical knowledge, when do you think? <laughs> My wife knows the answer. You can't answer. What's that? 4,000 years. Very close. Six to 10,000 years ago. Six and 10,000 years ago. Anybody want to guess the name of that one man that lived six to, six to 10,000 years ago that all blue eyes came from? So there's a big um, Adam, right? Okay. Adam, obviously, it's, it's Adam. I, I, they're, it's amazing. Science is just catching up with it. What? Yeah. Yeah. Adam and Noah, same, whatever. Yes, so uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, I also, I've said this before, but I went to the Great Barrier Reef, and there's a big, there was a big sign at the time uh, in Cairns, that's where you go to if you, you leave to go dive the reef. It said the reef, the Great Barrier Reef, I don't know how they date it. How old do you think they dated the Great Barrier Reef? Six to 10,000 years ago. <laughs> I don't know how they figured that out. They somehow can figure out the age of the Great Barrier Reef. And they said this, I, I'm not quoting it from memory. It's like, scientists don't understand why all the, where all the natural beauty comes from and why it's there. It doesn't really make sense, is basically what they said in this big sign here. And I'm like, ooh, ooh, ooh I think I know that. Um, but it's pretty, uh, I thought they're pretty interesting articles that are, uh, you know, really confirming the importance of Christianity and the Bible and, you know, just interesting. Okay, so uh, this morning I'm going to do uh, a lesson on finding God's will in our lives. And uh, Pastor Lou, i got a quote here. It says, finding God's will is a journey, not a destination. It's something that we constantly have to be seeking. And I'm not talking about, oh, I'm going in full-time ministry, or does he want me to be a, minis uh, a missionary? It's just something in our daily lives we should be seeking God's will. I... Um, uh, we just bought a van, and you know what? We're praying about it. We prayed about it. We said, God, give us the right van. Give us the right deal. We want your will here. It's a pretty uh, big purchase. You know, we're not just going getting a gallon of milk or something. You know, which brand should I get, God? You know, this is pretty big. You know, we want to get the right uh, deal, and you know, we um, so we prayed about it, and God gave us a, a, a tremendous deal, and you know, but that that should be our our view when we. We need God's will in our lives. And I'm just going to look at how to find God's will. You had that dreaded question. I remember when I was, uh, you know, in high school, they always ask you, what do you want to do the rest of your life? And I hated that question, you know. But really, it should be, what's, the God, what's God's will? And I've had to encounter that a couple times in my life. And I'm like, God, I want to do what you want me to do. And, and I want an answer from you. I want to know for sure uh, that I'm doing the right thing. Uh, we have to understand, because it's God's will, does not mean that it'll be the easy choice. Okay, It's not always the easy choice. It's the best choice. Not always the easy choice. Uh, the first thing we need to realize is the Lord has a plan for our lives. Uh, he's got a unique and uh, specific plan for every one of this, every one of us. And he had that plan before we were born. I, it just bothers me with evolution. And it's just like, you are an accident. You're random. You have no purpose in life. And... Uh, you know, we wonder why kids commit suicide, why they're in depression, because there's just no meaning. There's no purpose. But Christianity, we have God, and, you know, God says he had a plan for everyone in this room uh, before we're born. And that's just amazing. Uh, look in Psalms 139. 
Psalms 139. Psalms 139, verse 15 says, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, then they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. We see God has a plan here. God had all our days written out before we were born. We're not a mistake. Uh, We're going somewhere. You haven't been placed on this earth by chance. God gave you your personality for a reason. God gave you your parents. You're like, why did I get my parents, you know? God, you know, what did I do wrong, you know? But God gives, you know, gives us our parents for a reason. I was reading a book. It was on the Navy SEAL that killed Osama bin Laden. And he was talking about his up, upbringing. He had a rough upbringing. And I think he had a stepdad who, you know, kind of abused him, you know, just beat him all the time. But it toughened him up. And he talks about that. You know, I'm not saying go beat your kids to toughen them up. But, you know, it kind of, he, he's like, this, this SEAL training is nothing. He goes, he's, he's recounting all the stuff that he went through and he learned to deal with pain and, you know, and, and even through the bad things, he used it and turned it into something good. But God has a specific purpose for our lives. Why can we trust God to reveal his will? To follow the Lord's plan in our life, we must know what he has called us to be and do. I, it's, it's out of character. God is not trying to hide his will. I think that's something we have to understand. He wants us, you know, I want my kids to know what I want them to do. I'm very clear about that. And I'm going to let them know. I'm not going to let them, uh, you know, wonder, you know, well, is this really his dad? Do you want me to do this or not? I'm very, uh, very clear about that. I'm not trying to hide that from them. And God is the same way. It's, it's not like, a, um, you know, a little cat toy. And God kind of dangles it over here and then moves it away. And I think I got his will. And then he's like, ha, fooled you, you know, or the little laser. You know, those are the best with cats. Um, I did it once with, <laughs> I had, I was up in the balcony of the old building and I had a laser and I had kids chasing the laser until one of the kids, you know, ran into the pew, you know. Then I had to stop that and I, I hid while he was crying. But, um, you know, God's not dangling it in front of us saying, you know, oh, here's my will. Oh, you didn't, you missed it. You know, ha ha, you thought you had my will. He wants us to know and he cares about us and he wants us on the right path. And uh, he, he's going to do that. The Bible promises his guidance. All we need to do is ask. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And, and just think about that verse, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. We've got to have trust. Okay, that, that, I, It's easy for me to say, and I, I, I've told you stories. I've you know, not trusted God, and it's like, oh, we know he's all-knowing. We know he's all-powerful. We know he knows what's best, but sometimes just trusting him is hard to do. But trust him. Don't lean under our own understanding. We've got all our, well, this doesn't make financial sense, and this doesn't, i got to figure it out. And we got our human understanding. Don't lean not on thy own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. You know, there's some... Um, requirements here in all thy ways acknowledge him we got to make sure god is in part you know he wants to be involved sometimes we think we're bothering god you ever think that you know it's the little things and i don't want to bother this is just a little thing i'll just bother him with the big things you know i um somebody said once when when, when they got married they they made an agreement that uh she, the woman would uh, take care of all the small decisions and he would take care of the big decisions and they said 40 years of marriage there's not been one big decision yet <laughs> But, uh, you know, we kind of think, I, I, don't want, <laughs> I don't want to bother God. It's just a little thing, you know, and he cares. Do you care about your kids and little things and making them happy? And, you know, my, my son, you know, his blanket, he wants his blanket on and he's, you know, his lamp. And, you know, I want, I want them to, you know, have everything just right. I care about them, even the little things. And uh, God cares about us, too. The Apostle Paul indicated that it's possible to know the Father's will. 
Colossians 1, 9 says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And uh, I think we make the mistake of not going to God, just doing things on our own and our own wisdom. And then when things fall apart, then we ask God, and, you know, and then we go back and say, well, should I have done that? And uh, the verse says here, be filled with the knowledge of his will. Okay, we can know. He wants us to know. The Lord is faithful to reveal the path of the life to those that seek it. Famous verse, Psalm 1611 says, uh, Thou shalt show me the path of life, in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there is pleasures forevermore. Okay, so he's saying God's going to show us. God wants us to go on the right path. Just think of your kids. You, you know, I'm already thinking about their careers and what I want them to be. And, you know, I'm like, that'd be a great career. You know, I'll kind of funnel him in that direction. Give him a choice, but, you know, just, just show him how wonderful this choice is. I'm already kind of thinking, you know, and it's, it's up to God. It's in God's hands. But, you know, you've got to give them direction. You've got to have some advice when they ask. You think if my son says, you know, what, what do you think I should do here? I don't know. You figure it out. You know, I'm not going to tell him that. I, I'm going to use my limited uh, experience and knowledge to try to direct him in, in the best way. And, and I think God's going to do the same. God promises he'll do the same. Um, don't assume that God's will is automatically go, coming, going to come to pass in your life. It won't. God's will doesn't always come to pass. And uh, just take salvation, for example. Second Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So when we look at salvation, God wants what? His will is everybody gets saved, right? That's what God wants. He says that uh, not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want any to, to perish. Does everybody get saved? There are millions and billions of people that reject God all the time. And so people can go against God's will, and we have to understand that we can. It's not all preordained, preordained whatever I do, I'm just going to be on the right path, and I can't get out of, I can't get off the right path, and I'm just predestinated to do the God's will. I, I kind of think, I don't know if you remember when I was a kid, they had those Choose Your Own Path books. You ever read those, Anna? You, know, you could read them, and then you could pick the path, you know, and you had to turn to one page, and it set you on a different, uh, different path, and then you'd flip around, and if you want to choose this way, go to this page. I thought they were so cool. And if you want to go this direction, you know, go to this page. So I'd, I'd read it through and try every path, you know, to, to read it all and see what happens. But I think God has, you know, this is what he wants you to do. We still have free will. We can go off the path. I think God can give us another path, you know, another choice. I think we're constantly have choices and we can get back towards God's will or we can keep going our own way, but we can get out of God's will. We can. Uh, it's not God's fault either. We have a choice. It's in our hands. Once you realize that you are responsible for discovering God's will, the next step is to start seeking God for it. Okay, you're responsible. You make bad decisions. It's on you. Okay, but we, should, we have the ability, we have the power to go to God and uh, seek Him for the right uh, choices. He's not hiding His will from you. Okay, He's not, no, I'm going to keep this secret. I really want them to beg. You know, I really want them to beg. You know, I, I, I love my kids when you get a snack or a meal. It's like they just gravitate towards you. You get chips or something, and it's like suddenly they're your best friends, and they're just... <laughs> right there looking at you, you know, and they're as close as they can, and you can just see the little puppy dog eyes, and it's just, they're kind of begging, you know. Um, he's not hiding it from us. I, f I forgot where I went there. He's not making us beg for his will. He's sorry, I totally, <laughs> I'm not going to sit there and I really want you to beg. I really, you know, they'll beg anyway. But, um, but I don't, you know, I don't want them to beg. I want to, you know, make them happy if I can, if it's the right thing for them. But, um, we're going to have to uh, do some seeking to find us. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 tells us how we need to seek God. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me. And I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. So what does it say there? 
what do we have to seek God with? All our heart. Okay, God's saying, when you seek with all, our, all your heart, uh, you will find me. Okay, God's making a promise there. And I will hearken unto you, you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Sometimes we do it half-heartedly and we kind of, eh, just a little quick prayer and, you know, God, help me find a car, you know. Okay, I prayed, God, you know, he's going to do it. You know, I've, he knows what I want and I asked, you know. I, I don't think sometimes we do it with all our heart like we should, but he's pretty clear there. If we do it with all our heart, we, we will find him. Um, Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened to you. So God has a plan. God wants to share it with us, and God wants us to seek him to ask. Um, one mistake that we make in seeking God's purpose is we assume whatever they're good at, at the natural must be what God wants them to do. Okay, We think, well, I'm good at this. This must be what God wants me to do. So if you're naturally good at public speaking, they figure God must have called me. He just gave me this gift of uh, public speaking, so I, I, must do the, I must do that. Um, and I don't believe that's always true. I, I think it, the opposite is true more often than not. I, I don't know a lot of people that are just naturally public speakers. I think it's the biggest fear is public speaking. I read it. It's, it's public embarrassment is the biggest fear. It's, that's why public speaking is a big fear. But, um, you know, most people aren't these just natural public speakers. And so I remember when, you know, God called me to first preach, I was scared stiff and I was terrible. You think, I know what you're thinking. He's still terrible. I'd, not much changed. Okay, but you think, of, look at Moses. He's calling him to lead a nation, and he can't even, you know, public speaking's not, he's, he stutters. He can't even talk, and he needs somebody to do his uh, speaking for him. Uh, 1 Corinthians, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It says, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty men, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are Mighty and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him um, are, ye call, are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord." What is it saying? God's going to use the foolish. It says the weak. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. Why? Because God wants the glory. Okay, when, you're, when you can't do it and God uses you, everybody knows it's God, it's not you. When you're, you know, this super sharp person with all the speaking abilities and, you know, you get, you get all the glory. But God's saying, uh, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You look at uh, disciples. Who did he choose? Did he choose the most educated, eloquent you know, religious speakers, he chose mostly just working class men, just the salt of the earth, lower class, uh, working class men, and that's the ones he used. If you, the, there's a passage um, after Christ, uh, the resurrection, that it talks about they're speaking and they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they, can, they realize that. Why? Because they said, these are unlearned men. I can't remember who it was, was it? Was it Peter? I think it was Peter. And then they're talking and everybody's like amazed. Like, who are these? These are just fishermen and they're speaking like this. And people were shocked and they realized, hey, there's something different. This is the power of God in their lives. Um, God's will may have nothing to do with your natural gifts. If you can do something yourself naturally, you wouldn't need God's empowerment. Um, sometimes people's gifts may be an indication of God's will. But many have gifts and talents they don't even know exist. So understand that. I, I um, had a guy in a church, uh, Tom Rood, and he came along. He, he grew up in church, and I was taking pictures, and, and I couldn't do it for various reasons because I was involved in things. So I said, hey, Tom, here's a camera. Can you take pictures? 
And he's like, sure, I'll do it. He was just willing. He didn't say, oh, I love photography. He didn't volunteer. I just gave him the camera and said, here you go. And uh, later on, I gave him a Photoshop thing to do, to do with uh, pictures. And he ends up, be, that's his job now. He's self-taught. He became a graphic designer, and he does photography. And when he was, he was 18, 19, 20, he didn't know he loved those things till he got, he started doing it and he found out he had a real uh, talent and an eye for it. So sometimes we don't know we have the talent or the gift till we uh, start doing that. Um, but don't think, sometimes, you know, it doesn't mean, oh, you're really good at this. I'm going to put you over here because you're really, I don't want you to be, you know. So we don't always do that, you know. I, I do give when a Sunday school teacher um, comes along, I say, do you have a preference if, if I have different options? Do you like little kids or teenagers? Some people love teenagers and don't really like the little kids. Some people love little kids and can't stand teenagers. You know, I try to fit people where they're, where they're at, but don't always think that that's how God works. Um, pastor, it was a story a pastor told a very talented missionary. I think he was a doctor, and he's just very eloquent, very well-spoken, very well-educated. And he, uh, he told him to be careful when you go on the mission field. And the reason was, he said, because you can do everything in the flesh. You're very talented, and you can get away with it, and nobody can tell. And uh, we have to be, uh, be careful of that. You know, I didn't realize I enjoyed teaching or working with kids till I was thrown in there. Okay, I'm a... Uh, Brother Frank uh, tricked me into working on the bus, and uh, I had the wrong motives, I'll say that. And, uh, and then he put me on his bus, and, you know, at first, kids scared me, I'll be honest. It was intimidating. You're going down to the inner city, and it's not the most well-behaved uh, group of people. And it was, you know, a little culture shock, and it took a while. And after a while of doing it, I, I said, I really enjoy working with kids. I really enjoy teaching. So don't think, well, I'm not good at this, or this isn't my talent. You may not know your talents, or God may want to use you and uh, get the glory. So just be careful of that. How can you discover God's plan for you? Uh, first one is the Bible. Apply scriptural truth so you won't drift away from God's will. This should be our foundation of everything we do is the Bible. Psalms 119.105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And you think back then they didn't have all the lighting we do. You know, you go out in the country or you, you go somewhere where there's not a lot of light and you realize, wow, it's dark out here, you know. And uh, you think about it, in ancient times, they had to carry little lamps. I, I heard, I didn't check it out, that they had them on their feet, and then they would light up a, a few steps ahead of them so they could see where they're going. And uh, that's what God does a lot of times. He just shows us the next few steps. Okay, don't think, I, I, I think if uh, God would have shown me all the stuff that he's having me do when I was 18, I probably would have not stayed. <laughs> I would have been like, no way. <laughs> I am not getting up in front of all these scary looking people and, and preaching and teaching and doing all this stuff. I'm like, I'm out of here. So God, I think God will show us the next few steps and then he'll show us a little more. And once we get confidence and we say, I can do that, he'll keep showing us the, the path there. The word Bible is a lamp under my feet, light under your path. I, um, you know, we can get answers from the Bible. And uh, I remember I had the biggest decision of my life, uh, I got right with God, and I'm like, God, do you want me to stay um, in Australia or, or stay in America? Go back to Australia or stay here? I had a return ticket. I knew either way, if I went back to Australia, I was never coming back here. And, and I knew if, you know, if I stayed here, I was never going back. So I had this decision, and I, I prayed about it. And I'm like, I need to know 100% for certain. There's no, uh, I can't go back in a few weeks or months and say I made the wrong decision. I needed something, and I really... I was praying about it. I, I was willing to do either way, and that's important. Are you willing to do whatever God wants? Are you open? And I, I remember talking to my father. I called him, and he said, um, he said, I can't tell you the answer. I don't know God's will. And he said something about you need faith, and he talked about Hebrews 11. So I went, after I called him, I went and read Hebrews 11, and I came across this uh, 13, verse 13. It says, they all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, and truly if they had been mindful of the, that country from whence they came out of, they might have 
opportunity to have returned, but now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And I thought, wow. <laughs> you know, that, I know God didn't write that originally for me, but I mean, this was uh, 25 years ago when uh, America was a little more spiritual than it is today. It's kind of gone downhill, but Australia really wasn't a spiritual uh, place. I think it's got like 2 to 3% church attendance, and you know, America was a lot more spiritual 25 years ago. But I'm like, wow, God, that really uh, cemented. I mean, what is the chance of finding those verses about somebody seeking a country? And, you know, if they would have been mindful, they would have gone back. But now they seek a heavenly country. And I'm like, wow, you know, I, I think that uh, answered that question for me. So God gave me something. God can give you uh, things from his word. And I'm not saying he's going to do it every time, but I've had uh, him do it uh, several times one other time was, I know I've mentioned this before, we were praying, we had tried to have kids, and it didn't work, and uh, um, we ended up fostering, and then the kids had to go back to their parents, and we we're just like devastated, and like, where do we go from here? And we we're praying about whether to uh, try again. It was very expensive, and, and it may not work. It didn't work before, and we're just like, what do we do, God? We need to we need prayer. Is this your will? If you're against it, it's never going to happen. If you're for it, then uh, we know it can happen. And uh, my wife, she's more spiritual than I, she said, open your Bible and see if you can find something. And I don't think this works every time, but I don't think we just say, God, give me the answer. I'll open it. And, you know, God's going to do it every time. But he has. And, and I remember um, looking in my Bible, and I flipped it around a little bit so I wasn't trying to turn to Samuel or something at the beginning, you know, kind of on purpose, you know. And I opened it up, and it was right to the chapter. It talks about John the Baptist and his parents praying for uh, a child and God blessing them. And I said, I think that's a good sign. I know there's like four stories, roughly, Abraham, Samuel, and I'd never even thought about that story, to be honest. I've read it many times, and it never uh, occurred to me. Uh, what was going on there, but um, I said, I think we need to try again, and three kids later, it, it worked, but God can give us answers in His Word. So we have the Bible. How can we discover God's plan? Prayer. The Lord promises to guide us when we pray according to His will. 1 John five fourteen says, And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we had the petitions that we desired of him. What is that saying? God listens. He knows. We think sometimes he doesn't give us the answer right away or, you know, the answer we want that, oh, he mustn't be listening. He's just ignoring me. But he's saying he listens. He hears us. If we hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we had the petitions that we desired of him. His answer isn't always yes, but what is that saying? He hears us. He's listening. Okay, he cares. So we had the Bible, we had prayer, circumstances. Sometimes circumstances work out, it, it, you know, kind of show us God's providence. I remember um, when I was 18, I'd just come and my aunt, I was staying with them at the time, and she told me, you need to go to pastor school. And I was like, I'd never even heard of pastor school. I said, I'm not a pastor. I didn't even know what it was. And I was like, no way. I didn't have any money. I was looking for a job at the time, and I was volunteering at the school, and I, I was like, no way. And I said, just flippantly, I'd need $100. That was back when $100 went a little further than it does today. Um, I said, I, I'd need $100. I just said it flippantly and just never thought about it again. And um, I think the next day at the school, I was volunteering, they gave me a check. You know how much the check was for? hundred dollars. I'm like, well, I guess that's a sign from God that uh, God wants me to go. And, um, you know, so I ended up going and I ended up getting called to preach at the uh, at pastor school. So, uh, you know, God can use circumstances to allow things to, to work. You know, looking for a van, we prayed and, you know, you're not going to find a Bible verse that tells you, you know, <laughs> I knew we weren't going to find a Bible but that that Toyota is the one you need, you know, this is the one, not that Toyota, not that Honda. So I knew, you know, it's going to be tricky, and God, there wasn't really going to be a Bible 
verse in there that told us exactly which car and you can kind of make your own miracles and you know but we prayed about it and, and some things fell through and it was neat the one car we were willing to travel five six miles to go get a van uh, five six miles five or six hours sorry uh to go get a van and got to end up giving us one here right here in buffalo better deal than anything we could find the one guy i'll, I'll say this it looked good, you know, in the pictures, and it's hard to tell. And we called, we were asking about it. And the guy actually called back and said, look, there's some damage. What did he say? Hail? No, I think somebody had repainted it, and it looked bad. He said, you can't tell in the pictures. But, I mean, this is a used car. <laughs> basically talked me out of the sale. He goes, you can't see. He goes, I don't want you to drive six hours. And then you look at it and be like, whoa. And I go, can you send me some pictures of close up? And I could see. I was like, wow, this is bad. Something happened here. And I, People should not be uh, painting their own cars, or I don't know what happened, but something was not right that we couldn't tell. And I'm like, that's God's providence there. God's telling us, hey, maybe this isn't a good deal. And I've never had a car salesman talk me out of the deal that we were going to go for. But God can use uh, circumstances. Next one is godly counsel. Before taking advice, make sure the person, you, person counseling you leads a righteous life. Okay, Find the most spiritual uh, person you can. I love teenagers. Who do they go for advice? <laughs> They're teen friends that know just as, much, just as little or less than they do, and that's who they're going to get advice. What should I do? You know, I got all these, uh, you know, what do adults know? We don't know anything. You know, I, I, I told the teens when I was in chapel, I said, do you think you're going to know more in five years than you know now? And they're like, yeah. Do you think you're going to know more in 10 years than you do now? Yeah. You think 20, 25, 30 years, you might know a little more than you do now? Yeah. Well, you know, your parents are in that boat. They, they know a little more than you. They're a little older. They've made some mistakes and done some things. And, you know, they know a little more than you do. But make sure it's somebody leading a spiritual, godly life. Ask, what do you think the Word of God says I should do? You know, what we like to do is we like to ask five different people till we get the one that agrees with us, Right? Okay, that one says, no, 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 no. Oh, they said yes. Well, I'm going with that advice. I really like, that's really good advice. You know, we, we pick and choose, and we'll ask everybody till we get somebody that agrees with us. Or they tell the pastor, I've had people do it, I feel it's God's will. What do you think? I think, yeah, I think it's settled. I don't think you should be asking me. I think, it's, uh, I think it's already settled. Don't ever ask somebody, I think it's God's will. What do you think? What are they supposed to say? I don't think it's God's will in your life. They can't say that. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a stupid uh, question, to, a stupid thing to ask. You're really binding their hands. Don't come in there you know, with that, uh, saying that. I'm glad my son's not here. He'd say, don't say stupid. That's a bad word. <laughs> he corrects me all the time. I don't even realize what I, I, I said. <laughs> yeah, he's, 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 uh, he's, he's watching. He's keeping us all in line there. He makes sure his sisters aren't uh, looking when we're praying or, chew, or chewing with their mouth. <laughs> I, I love it when they do when you have guests, when they come over and then they, they start doing that. We had a Pastor Kuntz who had been doing a helping me with my building project and he, he looks over at Pastor Kuntz and says don't chew with mouth uh, don't talk with mouth food in your mouth I'm like <laughs> I'm like don't correct people son Shh. you know I, I don't know where he gets that from but uh you know he's he's keeping us in line there but um so another one is our conscience it's a moral filter of your life hopefully we have a godly conscience okay we can uh we can have a we can um trying to think of the word what a seared conscience yes okay we can sear our conscience and say well that doesn't bother me i feel okay doing that make sure we've got a godly conscience you know we're not saturated with television if you ever experiment go off tv and youtube for a month and then go watch it i i never had one when i was living on my own and then I'd watch it someplace and it was like, whoa, I can't believe all the wickedness on there because it stands out. If you are constantly watching this stuff, you, you uh, um, dulls your conscience. Familiarity breeds acceptance. So make sure you've you're got a sensitive conscience. Okay, We can see our conscience and say, well, that doesn't bother me. I don't feel convicted about that or that, I don't feel that's it bad. So be careful of that, but your conscience... You know, if somebody's saying this doesn't feel right or I, I, something's wrong, then be careful of that. A restless spirit. 
Um, do you feel dissatisfied or unsettled with your life? You know, I, I, I was working at a previous job here and I, I was a welder and then I got up into the front office and I thought I've arrived. I'm at a computer, air conditioned office. This is great. I'm not in the hot factory welding and, you know, breaking my back. And, you know, I thought this is great. I, I always wanted to be an engineer. I'm kind of doing drafting. This is kind of what I wanted. God gave that back to me and I thought I could do this the rest of my life. I'm like, I'm content. This is great. And something I remember just filing these papers and I'm like, what am I doing with my life? I am just changing lines on a paper, you know? And I'm not trying to minimize anybody's, you know, what, what you do. But I, for me personally, I think I want to make a difference and God kind of um, just put something in my heart. I want to do something different, not just, you know, change drawings on a computer all day. And uh, that's a few months later, a uh, pastor asked me to take over the school. And I was like, yes, you know. Um, but God gave me kind of a restless spirit there. Stay faithful. If God's called you somewhere to a ministry, stay there till he tells you otherwise. It's sad to see people quit before God can use them. And they, you know, we have to be careful of that. They think God's forgotten about them. Preacher used to say, and I'm not going to quote this right, he said, never quit until you've mastered something, until you've uh, reached a height in, in that area. Uh, I'm not saying it right, but don't quit while you're at the bottom of things, when things are tough is basically what he's saying. Like you get a construction job, what do they give you? The worst job. Okay, and nobody likes that. I'm going to quit. You know, this is just miserable. He's saying basically, you know, wait till you've mastered something. Wait till you're at the top. You know, if you're going to move on or move in a different direction, don't quit when you're at the bottom. That's the toughest uh, time. And we want to do that sometimes in ministry as well. This is just too tough. I just, you know, I'm at the bottom. But wait. And that's that's uh, good advice. Stay faithful. So just some quick uh, hindrances to discovering God's will. Self-will is the biggest one. We've already made up our mind. Uh, we don't want to hear what the Lord wants us to do. I, I, I preached on Wednesday about, um, you know, not giving your heart to God. We want to hold back that one key. We want to hold that self-will, and we don't want to do everything God wants. Be careful of that. If I examine your heart, say, you know, if God asked me to do something, would I be willing to do it? If God wanted me to go in a direction or do something in life, am I willing to do it, or am I holding back? Self-will. Another one is the influence of others. Uh, they may comment, God wouldn't expect you to make such a large sacrifice, maybe discourage you from obeying. A little background music here. Okay, I'm all, that's my, and I'm almost done. Uh, or it doesn't make financial sense, you know. Well, how can you quit a good job and go and make nothing at the school and you don't have insurance and you don't have all benefits and you don't have all this stuff and that really doesn't make financial sense sometimes in the world's eyes. And I'm not saying God's going to tell everybody to quit their jobs and join the ministry, but I, I had people when I did it say, you know, what are you thinking? You know, you're, you, this doesn't make sense. You have to think about your family and uh, don't you care about your family? And uh, sometimes people will try to influence you for making a godly decision. Uh, ignorance of God's word, doubt. Uh, God says, uh, Matthew 7, 7, Ask and it will be given you, seek and you will find. Don't second guess God's promises. Okay, sometimes we think maybe I, I can't do this or I'm not, I don't have the ability or does God really want me or um, we have doubt. That's the next one, unworthiness. Don't believe the lie that you are undeserving of the Lord's guidance or grace. Okay, don't think, well, how can God use me? Or I'm not good enough, or I don't have enough talent. Okay, if God's telling you to do something, do it. Busyness is another one. If your life is too full to pray, you need to reevaluate your priorities. Make sure you're praying. Make sure you're seeking God's will on everything. He wants to hear us. He wants to, you know, bless us and... Um, uh, another one is fear. When we're revealed, God will, God's will can seem impossible or feel foolish, but remember the Lord can bring good out of every situation. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Don't let fear you know, of the unknown, or I can't do this, or I don't know what's, you know. God's going to take care of us. God knows. God knows the future. God knows you can handle it. He's not going to ask you to do something you can't handle. Don't be afraid. And I know sometimes it's a step out, but um, 
you know, so just think about these things, whether it's ministry or, you know, God's moving in your life. Somebody asks you to do something and I appreciate people that step up. And I, I love when people say, well, I just don't think I can do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. I don't think I'm worthy to be a teacher, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I like that. I like people, you know, it scares me. Oh, I'm perfect for this job. I'm, you know, I'm going to be the best teacher ever. That kind of scares me. But when somebody says, I, I don't think I can do it, but by God's grace, I can do it. And... Um, that's the best type. So just some things to think about with God's will. You know, we should constantly be seeking God's will in everything. Don't think just the big things. And God only cares about the big things. I don't want to bother God. God, God wants to uh, direct our paths. He promises to direct our paths. We have to seek him with our whole heart. And he's going to guide us in our lives. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, dear Lord. We thank you that we have a God that has a purpose and a plan for our lives, that you care about us, and uh, that you want us to know your will. Help us to seek out your will, dear Lord, in everything we do. And, and um, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.